Well, greetings tonight. It's good to be able to be back again with you on the, the Jesus Movement platform. Um, just uh, want to welcome all the people that are coming on board right now. I see here um, we've got Sipo Makakula back again. God bless you, Sipo. Um, we've got uh, James Ngubeni, man of God. Praise the Lord. Welcome to you tonight. Uh, Stella Shezi, amen. Welcome, welcome, daughter. Uh, Joyce E. Sample, again, all the way from Philadelphia. Praise the Lord. She's been with us all these sessions, uh, Tuesday and yesterday, and welcome again tonight. Amen. Uh, Minister Sample, Mzwandile um, Rama um, Pekela. Oh. Sorry for messing up your name. Welcome, um, Zondile. Uh, and, uh, oh, Apostle Ruth Jackson. Welcome, woman of God, also from Philadelphia tonight. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you'll be able to, to stay with us tonight also. Praise the Lord. She joined us also, I think, the last uh, two sessions. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for, for coming on board. I trust that uh, so far those of us who have been following this particular series on the Jesus Movement uh, platform have really received something of help to you. And if that's the case, please let us know. Amen. And as we are going to get started in just uh, maybe two or three minutes, uh, we want to encourage you. I want to encourage you just uh, put up those, press those blue and red buttons. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. It does encourage us to see that uh, something is touching your life. Uh, something is encouraging you. Something is a blessing to you. Uh, feel free to post your comments and even your questions. Uh, um, if you have questions, I may not be able to respond to them live but I'll definitely do my best to respond to them um, on the Facebook page. And so we want to welcome also Senzo Mtlalose Ganduli. Welcome, Melvin J. Talley. Welcome. And I believe that's also from the USA. Praise the Lord. Doc Mbingo. Oh, Apostle. Uh, Bishop Mbingo. Praise the Lord. Welcome from Eswat Kingdom of Eswatini. Praise the Lord, man of God. What an honor that you should be able to join us tonight. Praise the Lord. And I see Apostle Ruth Jackson is saying this has been very informative. That's encouraging to know. Amen. I believe that knowledge is power, uh, especially when we're dealing with destinies, we're dealing with the kingdom of God, we're dealing with the king, with nations. Um, information that is relevant to what we need is very, very helpful. I see here Scott Anderson has joined us. Welcome, Scott. Amen. Lungi le pegi luthanga. Welcome. Figizolo. Zwane. Welcome. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, glory to God. Uh, we're going to get started now. And again, before we start, I want to honor the hosts of the Jesus Movement which is Pastor Siabonga Malinga and Pastor Lebohang Malinga, who are the visionaries of this platform. I want to encourage you to, uh, to stay in touch with what's happening on this Jesus Movement platform. Um, there's a powerful vision behind it to just bring the body of Christ together and collectively get the mind of God and insights that will help us to serve the Lord more efficiently, more effectively, uh, in this world that is so full of complexities um, and challenges. So uh, I want us to just, um, amen, if you can use those thumbs ups and hearts and give it up for uh, Pastor Siabonga Malinga and Pastor Lebohang Malinga, who, um, amen, are the visionaries behind this platform. And thank you for the invitation uh, for me to be able to share these uh, moments with you. And others uh, will always will be coming through and has been coming through on this platform. Amen. Bishop Magakula, welcome, man of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. So without any further ado, let us begin with prayer. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity once again just to be able to reflect, Lord, you said to the children of Israel that they should remember what you have done, to remember how you brought them out of Egypt, 
to remember the mighty works in the wilderness. And Father, as we also take time to reflect and remember what you have done, it encourages us to know what you are capable of doing and what you will do in the future. Because what you've done before, you can and will do it again. Now, Lord, we ask that you would anoint me and that you bless our time together and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Tabiso Tabete, welcome. Oh, glory to God. I see Mantla, Lamin Eswatini. Welcome, sir. Praise the Lord. Busi Sitwebu Ricozzo. Amen. Welcome. Tinisile Dayeli. Oh, amen. Oh, and Brother Lawrence, we are in Tetua from Eswatini. Praise the Lord. I see the hand wave. God bless you, sir. Um, and Nongosi uh, Dianji. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, let's get started. People are still coming on board and logging in. And that's certainly very, very encouraging to see the interest that uh, you have in this very, very important subject. Uh, I believe that we need to be like the sons of Issachar. The Bible says the sons of Issachar knew the times and the seasons so that they would instruct Israel in what they should do. Now, we cannot instruct Israel, that is God's church, in what they should do without, first of all, knowledge. Uh, many times we think that revelation just comes out of the air. But when we study the Word of God, we'll also discover that the prophets, the apostles, were tremendously grounded and deep students of the Word of God. Daniel studied the books, and by the books he understood the times and the seasons um, as Jeremiah prophesied that 70 years had been fulfilled and that the children of Israel were supposed to be restored back to the land of promise. So the prophetic and the apostolic is always rooted in studies, in research, in, in hearing from God. And, and so this is what we're doing. We're studying what God has done. We're studying the scriptures, amen, to see how God works, the workings of God, the ways of God. Um, not so we can preempt God, not so that we can take away his sovereignty in what he does, but so that we can have a sense of what he is doing so we know how to prepare ourselves and cooperate with God, whatever he's doing at that time. Oh, Claire Scott Briggs from the UK. Welcome, welcome, daughter. Uh, amen. Jabula Malinga again joining us from Durban. Welcome, sir. And my own daughter, Chloe Kamedze in the US. Welcome, my baby. Uh, amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's get started. So what we have, we have um, already said is that um, the Church of Jesus Christ was born in revival on the day of Pentecost, and that it will be taken up, um, consummated, if you will, in revival. God is always moving from glory to glory. He's always going from strength to strength. When we study the church history, it goes and ebbs and flows. Um, there are very low times in church history. And then you find that when the church comes to a certain low ebb, God has a way like a thermostat of kicking it back up. And then things are revived again and things are restored again. And then there's reformation, praise the Lord, to keep things moving forward. And, and so this is the pattern of Scripture, praise the Lord. And, and, and New Testament history is really about a study of revivals and reformations that have come and gone over the last two or so millennia. And uh, the body of Christ, I believe, once again is ready for revival. Um, and the world is ripe for a great harvest of souls, hallelujah, to be brought into the kingdom of God. Let me once again define what a revival is. Uh, in my own words, it is a great spiritual awakening that crosses denominational, national, geographical, generational, and cultural boundaries. Uh, a, a revival that I'm talking about is not just a great meeting in a church, not just a great conference 
in a church, not just a great crusade. Um, it is a move of God that goes beyond all these boundaries and sweeps like a mighty river, praise the Lord, across every kind of boundary and affects people way beyond even its epicenter as to where it actually began. Like the Azusa Street Revival, the epicenter was right there in Los Angeles in, uh, in Azusa Street. Uh, with um, uh, William Seymour, but the the move of God spread like waves and waves and waves all across not just America but all around the world. Every great move of God, every great revival, has gone way beyond where it started. That's what I'm calling a revival in this particular uh, case. Um, it, it results in a deep personal rekindling of love and devotion towards God, unusual manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and massive harvests of converts into the kingdom of God. Um, but I'm linking revival with reformation because I believe it's very, very important to do so. Uh, they are related uh, because re Reformation now is a compelling perspective of Scripture that results in a pragmatic movement to transform existing theological constructs, models, and cultures of denominations, churches, and ministries. It is usually driven by the desire to be relevant and effective in holistically implementing the Great Commission so that it results in actual transformation in the real world. Now, we're not here to be a deep theological uh, study on the matter. We can talk about a, a, a reformation in terms of a denomination. Denominations themselves can go through reformations, uh, but we are now talking about reformations that even go beyond a specific uh, denomination and that a revival, amen, I believe great revivals create a climate for great reformations. I believe that the real destination of revival is reformation because the cause of revival, the need of revival means that there's something wrong in the condition of the church. And the purpose of reformation is to to discover what it is that was structurally, organizationally, um, culturally, uh, out of alignment in the church that caused the decline in the first place and to attempt to correct it. Now, in every Reformation, they've always been by degrees. So I really believe that there's been reformational moves of God. I recognize that Martin Luther, who uh, was a reform, the great reformer who came out of the Catholic Church, was excommunicated by the Catholic Church, started the Lutheran Church, was the first of the reformational movements of God, the Protestant movement. From there, you would get um, all the way to the, to the Presbyterians, and we get the uh, Baptists, and, and in every move of God, there is a reformation. There's something that's trying to be corrected, to be brought back to order. Then we have the Pentecostal Reformation that is identified in 1906. And then we have the, the Charismatic Reformation that also came out of that, that went into even historical churches, the Methodist churches, and so forth. And then we have uh, the actual Word of Faith Reformation, which now began to really uh, bring people back to knowing how to walk by faith instead of walking by sight. I believe that is a reformation of the Spirit of God. And then we have uh, what you might call the apostolic and kingdom reformation. I don't know if it's really possible to separate them, but um, I, I obviously believe in both. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't call or accept people to call me an apostle because it's a reformation of the recognition that God set in the body five ascension gifts. Prior to that, there was only pastors and evangelists and teachers recognized. Um, 
prophets and, and, and apostles were said to have been to go have gone with the early church. And as a reforming movement of God, we affirm that these ascension gifts are still necessary and will be necessary until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And some have been given these graces as apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Another kingdom reformation is a revelation of the understanding, the perspective of the kingdom of God. The gospel that John the Baptist preached. He preached saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ came and said the same thing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he began teaching about the kingdom of God. This was the teaching of Jesus Christ. We preach about Jesus, but Jesus preach about the kingdom. And so we preach Jesus and the kingdom because you cannot separate the two. And so we talk now about the reformation of the kingdom movement, praise the Lord, which is a perspective understanding that the kingdom of God is what God is trying to and has always been building on the earth. It's in the Lord's prayer. It says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus came to bring the kingdom. He says, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come among you. And so the reformation of the kingdom is, is part of what God has been doing on the earth. And so I believe that uh, God has been continuously Amen. Restoring and reforming the church. And with each and every reformation, there are doctrinal adjustments. There are theological changes. There are governmental changes in how the church is run and led. Uh, there are cultural changes. And we're still on the road. Amen. I, I really believe that although Jesus is coming very soon, I truly believe that. But we are now on the cusp of one of the greatest reformations that God has been trying to work into the church, coming uh, on uh, piggybacking this great revival, which must bring a reformation. Praise the Lord. So I'm laying a foundation here to basically say, that the reason why I'm approaching this on a perspective of revivals and reformations because I believe that God is in both of them. Sometimes reformers are not recognized because they don't always uh, get immediately recognized in their lifetime. They start new patterns. They start new orders and ways of doing things. They write books. They, they, they interrogate doctrine and theology. And many times their theology and doctrines are only recognized late in their own lives or even in the following generation. And then people start researching and say, wait a minute, this person was right about this matter. Uh, revivalists are high profile people. Everyone knows about them. They're moving in great power and great glory. But I'm here to say that God needs both. Uh, it's very rare for a reformer to be a revivalist. And it's very rare for a revivalist to be a reformer also. These are two different graces. Uh, one is a public one, as I say, in the pulpit mostly. And then the other one is more in studies. It's in the study. It's in research. It's in um, analyzing and, and academic research many times. Uh, like John Calvin, I mentioned, uh, for example, these were um, uh, great reformers, praise the Lord. And I believe the reformers today, and we should be open in our minds and to recognize reformers of our day and to honor them for the work that they are doing. All right. So now we began um, last yesterday to talk about 10 common characteristics of a revival, 10 common characteristics of a revival. And we just dealt with one. Today, we're going to complete that. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we said that the first characteristic of a revival is a context of desperate human need, a context of desperate human need. I went at some length to uh, to illustrate that, amen, by looking at how revivals have been uh, somehow linked with um, global tragedies, um, wars, and pandemics. Yes, pandemics, you go over that if you didn't see that. Revivals emerge from a context of spiritual and moral decline, very, very key, uh, which leads to intense prayer. They can also emerge from catalysts of great turmoil and distress, 
like wars, as I've just said, natural disasters, uh, economic turmoil, diseases, and pandemics. And, and during such times of distress, or after such times of distress, people begin to seek God earnestly. People really begin to seek God because their world is shaken to the core. And now they begin to see that um, they need to turn their hearts towards what is eternal. Because all of this is going to pass away anyway. Uh, in large numbers, by the way. And God responds to this seeking and desire with revival and or a spiritual awakening. These two word the terms are interchangeable in my mind. Revival, spiritual awakening, they're pretty much the same. Um, they can be used interchangeably. So let's go to number two. The second characteristic I believe that is common uh, to revivals is a catalyst of general dissatisfaction with the spiritual status quo of the church. It is a, a, a catalyst um, because here's a fire that's going to be ignited. We've talked about a context of desperate human need. And then there's a catalyst here of general dissatisfaction with the spiritual status quo of the church. And as I said earlier, the body of Christ, the church, has ha always moves in ebbs and flows. It's almost like a, 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 a water, um, uh, what you call a boiler. And if you have a boiler, um, or in, in your wishes, got to get your hot water, there's a thermostat. The temperature goes to a certain point, then the, the heat gets cut off, it cools off, and at a certain point, the thermostat kicks back on again. And this is how God has seeming to me been working in the church, is that when the church gets lukewarm, um, that is now when something begins to happen, um, let alone getting to a point of cold. That when he gets to a lukewarm stage, like the church of Laodicea in the book of Revelation, believers begin to be stirred up with a passion for more of God. Remember that God made us for him. God brought us out of him. He said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. And he spoke to himself when he created man. Man is only truly man when he's connected to God. God is our oxygen. Hallelujah. Um, like a fish in the water. Um, he, God will create something out of the thing that it needs to survive on. And God made us to survive on himself. Now, when the presence of God and the experience of God begins to wane and people begin to experience a lukewarmness in the body of Christ, something like a thermostat begins to kick in to the believers and there's a sense of dissatisfaction now that makes people begin to cry out to God for more than what they are experiencing in the church. Many are gripped with a conviction that uh, that, is not, that is not all well with the status quo of the church in general. It is in human nature to look for a comfort zone. And once things go well, we tend to, tend to settle within a comfort zone. And that leads many times to a decline of what God is doing. And we go on autopilot in the church. We start relying on our programs. We start relying on our administration. We start relying on our infrastructure and our strategies and all these things. Instead of relying primarily on the Holy Spirit, who will then help us to build organizations around that. And so um, many people then begin to have a burning desire for more of what the Word of God promises and instructs to be manifested. Now, this is when the church is becoming lukewarm. This is when the church is beginning to lose its effectiveness, when it begins to be uh, carnal, it begins to be worldly, and uh, and sin begins to take root and, and begin to be accepted in the church and people become comfortable with it. That's a state of a lukewarm church. That is not to say we're going to be legalistic, we're going to be um, judgmental on people, but there's an environment that the body of Christ naturally has that uh, causes people to want to live God's way and live up to God's word. And when that begins to wane, we're now looking at a, a, a catalyst of general dissatisfaction. And this causes believers and ministers to seek a deeper experience and knowledge of God himself. 
So this is what now begins to make people seek more of God. You know, in a sense, church becomes repetitious. It becomes predictable. It becomes programized. It becomes boring. Um, it, there's nothing new that's happening. It's the same old, same old. And uh, this is a sign that something is not right because wherever there's life, there will be some effects of life. And, uh, and so whenever life begins to diminish, then we, we're looking at a need now for that thermostat to kick in into the body of Christ. You can do your own research. You do your own assessment. I'm not one of those that is a critic of the body of Christ because I'm part of it. I'm not a critic of servants of God because I am one. But I do recognize uh, that God has to many times come into a church, an organization, the body of Christ, to begin to change things that will begin to make normal, whereas to God, they are not normal. And so that's number one. Uh, right, so should I say number two or number one for today? Number three, we're talking about um, the common denominators for revivals, is an unusual burden for prayer, repentance, and holiness. An unusual burden for prayer, repentance, and holiness. In my observation, with every move of God, these three are major denominators um, in the mix. Uh, one, do, before the revival. Two, during the revival. And three, um, even the momentum of the revival. As it, as it were, after the peaking of the revival. So God puts a longing into the hearts of many for soul-searching prayer. And uh, it's no longer about things. It's no longer about me. It's about, Lord, search me. Lord, check my heart. Search my heart, Lord. And what is it you want to correct in me? It's, it's repentance. Lord, I'm sorry for where I've missed it. Where well, I've done my own thing. I've gone my own way. I've done it my way. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I'm repenting of my sin. Things that are, that are repetitious sins in my life that I've become comfortable with. I've allowed them to stay in my life instead of seeking your grace to overcome these sins. This is part of the preparation for revival. Consecration is a term that is almost extinct today. Uh, there are probably um, a lot of people, and I'll, I'll, I don't want to be down. I'm not down on on young people or millennials because I used to be a young person myself. Um, and no one is born knowing everything. You learn over time. But the word consecration, it means to, 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 to seek God uh, for God. Uh, that's what a concentration, consecrate, it's a, it's a concentrated search for God to set yourself apart for God. This is one of the things we're missing today. This is one of the teachings we're missing in the body of Christ. And every revival, I found that it comes from deep consecration. Uh, people spending time with God, seeking God uh, for, for, for days, for weeks, for months, overnight, fasting, 10 days, 21 days, 40 days, whatever the Holy Spirit instructs, there is a grace and a desire to consecrate, to set ourselves apart with God so that we can focus on God. And then sanctification, another term that is almost extinct today. Uh, sanctification means to purify, to sanctify, to make holy. And what we're talking about here is a product of consecration where we ask the Lord to sanctify us, to purify us, to work on our desires, to remove desires in our hearts that don't please God. Because that, that, that is, that, that is where many times the root issue is, is that we are led astray. The Bible says when a man is tempted, he is drawn aside by his own lusts and enticed. So if we can let God work on our own desires, we become less vulnerable to the enemy uh, coming in and, and uh, uh, you know, taking advantage of our weaknesses and so on and so forth. And then extraordinary workings of the Holy Spirit. Extraordinary workings of the Holy Spirit. Um, just give me a second right here to do something. 
Can I just um, plug that in? Praise the Lord. We might have lost some people on the way uh, because of a battery issue here. Um, let's talk about um, the fact that continuing to talk about this unusual burden for prayer, repentance, and holiness. Uh, this is when we find in history, prayer movements begin to be birthed forth. Uh, prayer ministries begin to abound. Uh, people with a burden to bring the church to prayer. Uh, why? Because the church itself or the churches are not praying at the level they need to pray and the pastors are not catching the vision for that uh, or the structure, the organization, the culture, all of this is not conducive to that. And so we find now prayer movements beginning to come forth and these people begin to cry out to God in intercession and repentance for personal life-changing encounters with God and intercession for revival. All right, so number four is a fresh and deeper revelation of the word. A fresh and deeper revelation of the word. And so this comes with revival also. And it's very important that it comes with revival. Because if people don't get deeper into the word of God, revivals can go badly wrong. And there are studies and there's history about this. I'll give you an example of that. Um, there are men of God who started well uh, as revivalists. We can talk about people like William Branham, for example, um, and, and others that you might research about who started well as great preachers. But because of errors in doctrine, uh, they went off course. And that is very damaging to the body of Christ. Uh, when there's false doctrines and errors, things that are completely inconsistent with the Word of God. Um, but there's also, I know of, uh, here in Southern Africa, remember I told you about John G. Lake, who came in the late 1800s into the early 1900s here in South Africa, anoint of God, a great Pentecostal preacher and, and teacher of the Word of God, moving great power. Uh, but now he was here for only four or maybe five years, according to the records we have, and then he left. Now, here's the thing. Now, here are these people who are on fire for God, have experienced the spiritual aspect of God, but they're not grounded in the Word of God. Now, this is where we began to develop, see another, um, another development that came about as a result of this um, this situation, excuse me, we're just trying to set up my other Facebook page so that people can, can log on again. Excuse me for that disturbance. Um, what happened was now, here is John G. Lake coming to a South Africa um, of people hungry for God in the black communities primarily. The move of God comes, people experiencing great manifestations of the Spirit, but there's no teaching involved. These people are not taught in the things of the Bible. And so what came out of that was um, very, very um, uh, spiritual but unbiblical practices that came from that particular um, uh, revival. And many of them, because of a lack of teaching, mixed what was biblical with what was cultural. And so we have what is called syncretic faiths where people still believed in the ancestral spirits, but they still say they believe in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. From there, we have these Zionist movements, if you can call them that. Uh, they are cults. We've got the Shembes, Lachenyanes, and the like. Uh, we've got these people that don't go to Bible college. They don't believe in Bible college and Bible training. They believe in just being spiritual, but the result is tremendous errors and a mixture of things that uh, could come from God and things that are demonic also. This has been the plague of the church in Africa, is uh, being having a pure move of God that would not be mixed with other things. But thank God there are many uh, ministries and organizations uh, that, and that are, are pure in the sense that they truly follow the word of God and they're clear about where these spirits come from and that uh, they believe in the Bible, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit 
and uh, and they cast out demons and they do not recognize demons as ancestral spirits that should be honored and respected and left alone. So this is very, very important, is that a true revival that's going to be helpful or helpful to the church must be based on the word of God so that error does not creep in to the move of God. Okay, um, so... Uh, so it brings believers into a better understanding of the Word of God. True revivalists are true preachers of the Word of God. Um, they, they, they always stand with the Word, uh, and that's it. They don't waver from what the Bible says. They're not going to compromise because of popular opinion or because of culture or whatever. They're going to stand purely on what the Word of God says because that's very important when it comes to revival. And uh, with that comes revelational truth. Revelational truth. I'll just talk about ref, um, uh, ref, reformations um, that come with what I call, or what is called restored truth. For example, Martin Luther brought restored truth, uh, which says that the just shall live by faith. That came from Martin Luther. Uh, the Catholic Church was saying that you have to be saved by good works, by going to Mass, and uh, paying your, your dues and, and purgatory and all that, and basically bringing people into a slavery of works under the Catholic Church. And Martin Luther challenged that this was a revelation of the Word of God, um, that no salvation is by grace only and not by works. A revival brings and establishes revelational truth. Uh, the Pentecostal revival brought new revelation about the baptism into the Holy Spirit. They studied it. They taught it that the baptism in the Holy Spirit, according to Acts, is an experience, a distinct experience after salvation, um, that no matter how long it takes after salvation, where a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, with the manifestation of the speaking with other tongues. Very divisive doctrine around the body of Christ, challenged by evangelicals and other people, but it came with a revival because these people actually experienced it and it was in the Bible. And then another um, common denominator is a fresh and deeper, uh, shall I say, extraordinary workings of the Holy Spirit extraordinary workings of the Holy Spirit. And of course, this goes almost without saying, but we must say it, that when we talk about a revival, we're talking about things that are completely um, off the chain. They are beyond what people normally experience in a church environment or a Christian environment. The Holy Spirit takes people to a spiritual depth that they could not achieve on their own. Uh, it's not something we can just want and earn. This is something the Holy Spirit does. And he draws us. I remember in our congregation when the Lord was drawing us to seasons of chasing after God. And when I look back now, and we would chase God for, for weeks on end, um, meeting almost every night. And one time the Lord told me he wants us to chase him for a hundred days. Now, we can't just decide to do that. You need a grace to do that, to be able to just do it without ending up doing it by the flesh and by ritual and by, you know, duty. That comes from God itself to say that I want you to, to seek me as a congregation for 100 days of chasing God. And my goodness, did God show up. My goodness, did we see the presence, the move, the power, the glory. Uh, the, uh, God just opened himself to us in such wonderful ways uh, during that time of chasing God uh, as a congregation. So we're talking here about an unusual grace given to experience the moving of the Holy Spirit on a personal and corporate level. Now here I'm not talking about uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit that come because of a minister. I'm going to talk about that later. I'm not talking about sovereign things that God does by His Spirit uh, without being asked to do them. 
in terms of um, you know someone programming you know planning it or making a program about it this is something that God just brings and and um, the Bible says for example that uh, in the Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 that the whole place there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind and uh, and Tongues as of fire settled upon those that were in the upper room. Now that is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about extraordinary things no one asked for, no one prayed for, and no one can take the credit for. Um, the Bible says they prayed and the place was shaken in Acts of the Apostles. And I've experienced that by the grace of God. I remember one time we were having a time when we we're chasing God in an in a eastern part of South Africa in worship. And um, we were just worshiping the Lord. And uh, had taught on worship and just chasing God. And uh, oh my goodness, the whole building was shaken uh, to such a degree that there were barely anybody was standing in the building. Everybody was fell. No one prayed for anybody. The building just shook. And people started falling. And I, I felt the shaking like everybody else. I'm on the pulpit and we are worshiping the Lord. And there was no one preaching at the time. And not only that, we felt the building was being uprooted out of the ground. I'm telling you, if it wasn't for the fact my own children are witnesses, the children that were there ran to the doors of the building because this is at night, right? It's dark out there. And they all felt the same thing like this. You Normally you feel the Holy Spirit come down. This time the Holy Spirit like dug the building up and took it up. And they ran to the doors because they all felt this thing only to find, no, it was not physically the case. And those are shakings of the Holy Spirit where the whole place is literally visibly shaken. Um, these are supernatural, extraordinary um, workings of the Holy Spirit that only He knows uh, what, what, uh, why He does those things. We're talking about fire uh, being, being manifested and uh, the fire of God falling upon people without even being prayed for. We're talking about people being slain by the Spirit without anybody even laying hands upon people. Uh, just by the move of the Spirit of God, people laying before the Lord and hours and hours pass. I remember because I was part of a move of God in the kingdom of Aswatini as a young preacher. And it's amazing. One of the things I want to say as, a, as an aside here, many times we experience moves of God and we only recognize when it's over that it was a move of God and it was a revival. But we were in the midst of a revival in the kingdom of Aswatini. And I remember going to pray and uh, minister at a, um, a, a college for nurses in another city in, in, in Swaziland, Manzini, another city at the Nazarene Hospital. And I was asked to come there by their fellowship to, to minister. And I ministered by the Spirit of God about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit just broke out in that place. Now, that would have happened probably regularly in, in, in a normal service. What was extraordinary here was that this went on for hours. There was no stopping it. I had to go, I had to catch a bus and go back to my city and leave them there because they were going on and on and on and on in the spirit, caught up in God. I had to, I had to go. And, and I'm talking about things that God does sovereignly uh, by his spirit, praise the Lord, extended services where People just don't want to leave. They can't leave. They feel like they're just captured by the presence of God, by the anointing, by the Spirit of God. These are the things that happen in revivals many times. We don't prescribe them. We can't ask for them. Uh, we, we just let God do what He's going to do. So, number six, an unusual passion for and a harvest of souls. This is very, very key. Um, unbelievers begin to respond to the preaching of the gospel in unusual numbers. There's just a cry, a hunger, a desire for God and a response to be saved and to be delivered from sin and uh, to experience God for themselves that the unbelievers are literally flocking um, to the, the house of God or to the crusades uh, of these men of God um, oh my goodness, my, 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 um, my mother tells me about the outbreak of, and she's still alive, praise God, 85, almost 85 years of age now, um, 
And she was a present in the great revival of 1950 um, here in South Africa uh, through the Assemblies of God Church, um, which was, as you have heard me say, was led by and uh, by the founder was um, was uh, Reverend Nicholas Bengel. My grandfather, um, who was T.J. Mbata, was one of his evangelists, one of his first evangelists. He was a Methodist preacher, and then God called him out of that into uh, to join the Back to God crusade under uh, Reverend Nicholas Bengel. And um, the man of God said to him, okay, if God has called you, and this was his MO, his modus operandi, how he did things, if God has called you, then I'm sending you to East London. By this time, the Assemblies of God was still just, uh, this was still a, a denomination, uh, unfortunately, under apartheid. So this was the black denomination of Assemblies of God. Uh, nothing magnificent was really happening at that time. And um, himself, Reverend Bengel, was with my father in the south of uh, Swatini in Tluti, where our, our home is there. And uh, he heard from Tluti uh, by telegram. That was the communication of those days that revival had broken out in East London. What had happened was that um, my grandfather had put up a, a tent uh, right there in the squatter camps of East London near a rubbish dump literally. And um, people, suddenly the Holy Spirit just broke out and people started getting saved on masses. They would come by the bus loads and the bus loads, the train loads and the train loads to the point that this revival got so big, it covered the entire city. My grandmother used to tell me there was worship going on in the trains, in the buses, in, in, in everywhere on the streets. The fire revival broke out and then this message came to Reverend Bengu while he was with my father and then he took uh had wanted to took a train to to go down there which is another story for another day uh how he even got there which is miraculous because he had no money to even travel to East London but the revival had broken out and um so this was just an extraordinary harvest of souls that were just beginning to stream into the kingdom of God because revival had broken out in East London. And, uh, and that's, a, and I could go on and on, of course, because we are talking about my grandfather now. So I have many, many tales and stories about that. But let's go on. A changing of the God, a changing of the God is another phenomena of revival. Very, very powerful. As God raises new wineskins, uh, and I'm using that in the context of the word of God, that Jesus says you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. You must either, uh, otherwise you'll lose both the wineskins and the wine. He says you must have new wineskins for new wine. A revival is always new wine, which means that there are existing old wineskins. An old wineskin is a wineskin that's been used before, but it's either dried up or it's been overstretched already. It's very, very vulnerable. It's very weak. And new wine is very potent and it's still going to uh, ferment and it will still stretch the skin and it will burst the skin if it's not um, in a good condition. And so there's a change of the God in a revival when God raises new wineskins prepared by God beforehand uh, in obscurity. Previously unknown individuals, uh, ministries or movements are suddenly thrust into the limelight by God. Uh, while the older or the old order, it, or the older wineskins or old order is, is moved more into the sidelines. Um, and the new wineskins become the voice and the trustees of the new thing that God is doing in the earth. Now, that's a whole subject all by itself. But in every real revival, you find this phenomenon. Suddenly, out of nowhere, we hear of evangelist so-and-so. Um, in, in, in West Africa, we, we talk about Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams. Um, he, he was a spiritual son of a great man of God, um, in Tulsa. Um, and, and, uh, and, and God raised him supernaturally. He was literally found in a rubbish, uh, bin, uh, as a child. And he found God. Uh, his name, the name of the preacher that discipled him, mentioned, mentored him, and anointed him was T.L. Osborne. And God just supernaturally raised this man of God, an um, Archbishop um, uh, Benson Adahosa. I almost said Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams. 
Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams is the spiritual son of um, Archbishop Benson Idahosa. And Archbishop Nicholas Duncan Williams, a great man of God, love him dearly, based in Ghana. Um, but so there's a, there are these fires that came and, um, and God just raised people out of obscurity. Out of nowhere, uh, suddenly this man of God was used in signs and wonders. Uh, and there was an old order of existing churches that began to fade in comparison to uh, these great men of God that God was raising at the time. Praise the Lord. And so uh, this is one of the phenomenon of a revival of also. It's very common that there's a new God that's raised. Not always. Sometimes God just continues to use certain vessels uh, because he's seen fit that they can be used in the next move of God. But more often uh, than it ha not, uh, there's another wave of minister that begins to emerge from somewhere in obscurity into the forefront of what God is doing. And many times an unexpected vessel uh, and many times an seemingly unqualified vessel. Uh, in the eyes of the existing order. Let's go on. We must finish. God, number, number, we're talking about number eight. God is magnified and glorified. God is magnified and glorified in a revival. So what we find is that God receives praise, honor, and glory for bringing revival. Um, new songs of praise and new songs of worship to God are birthed. New forms of worship sometimes come forth from a revival, and they carry the spirit of revival across denominational, cultural, age, and even national boundaries. Uh, there are songs that we sing today that, if we research them, came out of revival, and they went all across the world. Um, and this is also one of the phenomena of a revival. New cultures of music, new styles of music and ministry are birthed and can become many times mainstream. And then another phenomena is reformation and movements. I'm going to touch on this one because I've already spoken quite at length about reformation. But true revivals and awakenings produce lasting fruit. They produce lasting fruit. They don't just burn and go and disappear like a piece of paper that was burnt. New ministries are birthed forth. New ministers are birthed forth. Movements and churches are birthed forth out of a revival and reformation. And society oftentimes experiences reformation. Another study for another day. Um, as more and more people are converted and impact society with the practical application of their faith. Okay. And then uh, number 10 unusual spiritual manifestations unusual spiritual manifestations um so quickly here again we're talking about mass outpourings of the holy spirit extraordinary ministries we're talking about ministries with hundreds of thousands of people um millions of people um the moves of god like in south korea dr cho who can deny that that is a move of god where this man of God has been used not only to have the biggest church in the world, but many other churches experience revival in that city of Seoul, Korea. Okay, it's not just his church, but all of them became mega churches. This is a move of God. Um, uh, supernatural healings, glory to God. Uh, miraculous um, healings, creative miracles, people raised from the dead. Um, and we read of these things. Um, I'm, I'm, and I wish I had time now. My time is running out. But William Duma, a great man of God I talked to you about from here in South Africa in Durban, a Baptist preacher used in healings, very, very humble, wrote a book called Take Your Glory, Lord, my father's mentor. Um, he, he, my father would tell me the story of how this, uh, because he would visit him periodically in Durban. Um, and he would talk about this lady, young lady, who would never, who was serving in the ministry, in the house, and um, would never look at the man of God in the face. And everybody else, you know, didn't have that problem, but she just could never look at him in the eyes at all, ever, to the point that my father was very disturbed about this, and he asked him about this young lady. and said, why doesn't this young lady ever 
want to look at your face at all and you, in your eyes. He said, oh, and he kept on putting it off because he was that kind of person. didn't want to talk about what God had done through him. One day, my father badged him enough to get an answer. He said, well, you know, this young lady actually died. And, uh, and God sent me there to, to raise him from the dead. And ever since then, um, he, she had never been able to look at me in the face. And, and that was it. You know, that's extraordinary when people start getting raised from the dead. Oh, my goodness. Um, but this is what Jesus also promised. We're talking about extraordinary miracles here, creative miracles here, uh, where people's limbs are literally being recreated as we see them, praise the Lord, and so forth. Visions and trances of heaven and so forth. Uh, sovereign signs, praise the Lord, that can happen of all different kinds, often accompany a revival. Now, these vary. We can't ask for many of these things. Um, they, 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 well, I'm going to say we, we cannot predict them, uh, but God will anoint certain vessels to operate in great power, in great signs and wonders. Praise the Lord. And then, and I'm going to put a two more in, in as a bonus here because of the few minutes we have left. Unconventionality and controversy unconventionality and controversy accompany revivals. So revivals are always unconventional. Very, very important. They're disruptive. This is God's disruptive work in the church. They are unconventional. They always break out of certain religious norms, traditions, and expectations. Whether that might be in the case of race, which happened in the Pentecostal movement, which broke the color distinctions of race in the United States of America, whether it might be gender, when God raises great women of God like Maria Woodworth Etta, uh, the Foursquare Church in California from that revival and caused a, a woman to start a move of God when people didn't believe in women preachers at all, uh, traditions of different kinds, and so forth, whether it could be age-related, where God raised up a young preacher um, like a D.L. Moody, a businessman like him, um, who wasn't even Bible-trained at the time. He was just a businessman, and God uses him to bring revival. Um, uh, where he breaks cultural barriers, it doesn't matter what it is, but revivals are disruptive. The revivals are always unconventional, and they come with controversy. As a result, many revivals are actually fought and have been fought by the old order and those who hold on to these traditions, whereas God is trying to shake things up deliberately so that he can take the church to another level. So as a result, controversies abound about unusual manifestations, ministry practices, unconventional, um, uh, uh, religiously unqualified preachers to say, well, who is he? That man, you know, he's got this and he's wearing that. And, you know, how can a man, God use a man like this or a, a woman like that? People don't even know. Catherine Kuhlman was divorced twice and God still anointed her. Um, the gold figure. You know, God will shake people's theology up. And there was a great man of God with tattoos that God was using in Florida and the great revival there in the 1990s. And people had problems about Todd Bentley and his unconventionality. But no one could question what God was doing through him um, and so forth. So God shakes up things um, and, and changes cultures and shakes cultures to make people see that this is God. OK, you cannot put God in a box of your choice. Okay, and um, so let's let's go on. And finally, uh, a revival has a lifespan. It has a lifespan. This is by observation. We're believing God for revival that won't end, praise the Lord, until Jesus comes. But um, revivals generally have a catalyst um, context, a place of origin. Um, they, there's a where they begin. There's a starting point. You can point to where the revival came from, where it began. There are frontline ministers God raises um, for and to champion the cause of that revival. And there's an expansion phase when that revival is spreading. There's a maturity phase where it plateaus. And then there's a decline phase and sadly, usually an end. Why? Because a revival is God intervening sovereignly in and through his church in order to bring it and the nations into alignment with his original purpose 
and his preordained timetable. So when the church comes into sync with God's timetable in terms of what it should be doing and how it should be operating and the condition it's in, revival has fulfilled its purpose. Now reformation must take it from there to maintain the momentum of that revival and to continue it. Glory to God. And so here we are. Uh, after three sessions with you, I've enjoyed myself. Praise the Lord. I've tried to cram so much into this space of time. I hope that somewhere along the line, something has helped you. Something has inspired you. Something has challenged you. Something has blessed you. As for me, I'm seeking God. I am praying. We are seeking God. We are expecting revival. I truly believe that we are ripe for a global earth-shaking, world-moving, nation-changing revival and reformation right now. I truly believe that this COVID-19 is God setting the stage to, because of the moral decline of our world, because the spiritual condition of the body of Christ, and because of the desperation of humanity right now, that people are beginning to cry out to God. I really believe that the environment is ready. It's just got to just strike a match. Praise the Lord. And I'm telling you, the church is about to catch fire and the world within it. I believe that we're about to see the biggest inflow and influx of souls coming into the kingdom of God. And I'm talking about millions and hundreds of millions. One great prophet has gone to be with the Lord, Bob Jones, and a man of God that spoke into my life, laid hands upon me, is now with, in God, with God in glory. That man of God sp- prophesied of a billion souls of young people. Young people, hear me now. This is your time. This is your moment. This is your season. God has brought you into the kingdom for such a time of this as this. Don't stay in the sidelines. Don't stay in the background. Let God use you. Rise up and let God use you. This is a move of God that's going to use young people like never before. And young people from all cultures and subcultures are going to be swept into the kingdom of God by the masses. I am so excited, praise the Lord, and I'm great. I'm looking forward to seeing the manifestation of these things. Thank you for joining me on this Jesus Movement platform. God bless you richly, in Jesus' name, amen.